In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Christ is in our midst. I believe, help my unbelief. I can think of few better examples of what it is to be a Christian living in the modern world than this man from 2,000 years ago. This father who utters these words is clearly someone of belief. He's seeking Christ's healing for his son, and yet he has unbelief mixed in with his belief. Often we call this unbelief doubt. And according to philosopher Charles Taylor, everyone in our modern age, he says, is tempted towards doubt. But the doubt that we experience today, the doubt of this world, is very different from the doubt of the past. For example, there was a woman in her late 60s who once shared with me the single most formative experience within her, within her relationship to the church. She was seven years old, and she was a little mouthy. And during the Sunday school lesson for that day about Noah's Ark, she raised her hand and she asked her teacher, how did Noah fit all those animals into the ark? And the reply from her Sunday school teacher came, how dare you question God? Christians don't doubt. She got no answer. And she felt belittled and shamed for asking what to her seemed like an easy and rational question. She just wanted to know. And this was some 60 years ago. But that question on that day led to other questions that she would ask the rest of her life. Is a Christian really allowed to question or have any doubts? If God is so powerful, powerful enough to build an ark and fill it with animals, why is he threatened by my questions? And if my questions are actually threatening, then maybe this God is not as powerful as I've been told. That was 60 years ago. The doubt was primarily over the power of God. Can he really do the things that other people tell me he does. Now, of course, some of this still exists in the world today. The mystery of God will always keep us wondering and asking. But that's a beautiful thing that draws us closer and helps us to grow in a secure faith. But today, that doubt that pervades the world is a little different. Taylor, who I mentioned earlier, describes today's temptation towards doubt or struggle with unbelief resulting from what he calls the nova effect. In astronomy, a supernova is the explosion of a star. It sends particles and debris flying out in every direction. What was once previously one entity is now uncountable items floating in the atmosphere of space. So today, the accelerated rates of communication bring us into contact with things that would have once been out of our reach. I can now learn about religious beliefs from cultures around the world, scientific discoveries, political philosophies, social causes, artistic expressions, all of which provide a meaning of basis and a way of organizing their lives of millions around the world, which may have differ from what I've received. I'll give you a simpler explanation. We could talk about peanut butter. It's Lent, after all. We had a family in our parish that was living stateside for a brief period of time, just about two years. Their home was in Singapore, and they had recently returned. I asked the husband, who grew up and was an American, but spent the majority of his life living in Asia, what were some of the transitions coming back to the United States? And he said, peanut butter. He told me a story about how his wife once sent him to the store to get the groceries, and on the list was peanut butter. And he explained that in Asia, he'd be lucky if he could find peanut butter. And if he did, there was only going to be one brand. So when he went to the grocery store and walked into the peanut butter aisle, his anxiety spiked. Regular, crunchy, natural regular, natural crunchy, peanut butter spread, which is not the same thing as peanut butter. And then even if he settled on a style of peanut butter, he would still have to pick out a brand. Jif, Peter Pan, Skippy. Justin's, for those of you who shop at Whole Foods. But then sitting right next to the peanut butter is almond butter, and well, they didn't get that. Maybe she might want that. But then, same problem. Multiple styles, multiple brands, cashew butter, then there's sunflower butter, and then cookie butter. What's that? 
all in the same aisle, all on the same shelf. The proliferation of nut and cookie butters became overwhelming, and he came in knowing something, but as soon as he was confronted with all of the many different options, he began to doubt what he really wanted. That is what has happened to us in the terms of religion, politics, worldview, and source of meaning in our life. So the question becomes for us, with all these options before us, how can I be sure that I'm choosing the right one? Is there even a right one, or are they all equally valid, as the world seems to kind of say? But then, if they're all equally valid, do I really have to stick with one because that one's equally valid too, and the one that I'm practicing is just the one that I'm practicing, and it's not any, other, it's not any more true than any of the other ones? Honestly, we've been fasting for six weeks now. There are easier forms of Christianity. Why follow this one if all the other ones are just as equally true? Or why even be a Christian at all? Those of you here today in high school, young adults, aren't you more concerned about this than you are how many animals can fit on the ark? We no longer doubt the existence of God because we question his power. Instead, we doubt the relevance of a God who is just one source of meaning amongst countless others. Now, we could, as the church, respond and address this doubt by stating that it is not just one source of meaning amongst countless other valid options. That it is the only valid truth that Jesus Christ is the Son of God who came into the world to save sinners. That there is no other God but the one God we confess in the creed. And all of that is true. So true, I stake my life on it. I submit my every action to it, and I dedicate my life to preaching it. But in this worldview and the culture around us, it doesn't matter, because that's just my truth. True for me, yes, but not necessarily universal and accepted by the whole world. That's the same worldview that thinks we need more options and more brands of peanut butter. I don't have the time to get into how we got here. I would love to in the future explain how we came to the point where everything is equal and everything is valid and therefore nothing is. And as a result, we are plunged into doubt. But for today, I just ask you to follow along. Our culture preaches that every individual is the arbiter of their own truth. Things can be true for me and not true for you, and as long as we're not harming one another, we can both hold our mutually exclusive and logically incompatible truths simultaneously. We've been sold on the idea that this is in fact freedom, but instead of empowering us, this Nova effect has introduced an entirely new form of doubt so that even here today, we who are believing have a different unbelief from the generations past. An unbelief that comes when we are faced with so many options and we are told that they are all true. How do we choose the right one? And if they are all true, is any of it true? Is any of it relevant? Unfortunately, the question of today is, how do we address this doubt without applying or appealing to truth? How do you share the gospel, the gospel of truth, when truth itself is relativized? We can no longer, as I said, make appeals to truth or truth claims because that's just our truth. Never mind that in reality, our faith is objectively true, handed down to us by the Holy Spirit through the ages. Today, people will only listen to the truth after they've already decided to listen. Statements about how ancient our faith is only appeal to people who are already looking for an ancient faith. Affirming that we are the true church is laughable to an outsider who has this type of doubt when they Google Orthodox churches and they find that 40 minutes away from this Orthodox church, there is the genuine Orthodox church. Because if we're Orthodox, maybe you should try the genuine one if you're really looking for truth. It's a thing, look it up. It's not canonical. 
sharing the truth, unfortunately, in this day and age, comes second. Combating doubt with facts and statements is no longer effective because everything has been relativized. Instead, when it comes to responding to doubt, we, the church who knows the truth, we turn to experience and story. The one and only story throughout the ages is the story of God saving his people and sanctifying his creation. By sharing our experiences of the salvific and the sanctifying work of God in my life, we fight against the relativism of this age. Let's return now to the father from today's gospel. When he returns home to his wife with his healed son, he will tell her about how he struggled to find a cure, how he brought their son to the disciples and they were not able to cast out the spirit, how all seemed lost until this person, Jesus, rebuked the spirit how our son convulsed and lay on the ground and I thought that he was dead and my heart was shattered. Surely I would have rather dealt with his illness for the rest of my life than to lose my son. But then this same Jesus took him by the hand and raised him up. From this day forward, when this man, this father, is asked about his encounter with Jesus, he will share the story of his son's salvation. What happened to his unbelief? It's gone because his eyes have seen salvation. When someone then asks, how do you explain this? Then he will try to explain it. But first he starts off by sharing the salvation and the healing that his son has received. Not only this man, but the church, we do this. To this day, we tell the story of this man's son's salvation. This is the answer to doubt. It doesn't make sense to argue truth claims in a world that claims there is no truth. But my story of salvation, the story of God in my life, I have no doubt because the Lord has taken me by the hand and raised me up. So many times, like this little boy, I have been convulsed through sin and through illness and through tra tragedy in my life. And that same one who raised up this man's son has raised me up. I have no doubt because I know that I have been lifted up by the Lord. I have seen it. I have experienced it. But we can't address the doubts of the younger generation if we don't ourselves know the moments when God has raised us up. The world will continue to struggle with this modern Nova peanut butter style of doubt as long as we ourselves, those who know the truth and have received salvation. Those who know that Jesus is the Son of the God Most High and who's come into the world to take on flesh to save us from sin and death, as long as we who have experienced that, as long as we who have been raised up cannot articulate and share the stories of when we have experienced that truth, the world will continue to struggle with doubt. Our stories may not appear as dramatic as casting out demons and healing lifelong illnesses. But in all honesty, what's more dramatic than dying and being buried in the font of our baptism to be lifted out by the hands of a priest and resurrected unto new life? If you have no other story than the story of your baptism, you have the most dramatic story ever told. Your death and resurrection, your rebirth, and your salvation. Amen.